Hi everyone, my name is Ollie. Welcome back to the channel. I'm a final year medical student at the University of Warwick in the UK. Now, first interview preparation video of the new year. I know that many of you have either had your interviews in the previous week or you're expecting them in the next couple of weeks. I just wanted to say, you know, I'm sorry I haven't been able to produce more this year, but I really hope your interviews have gone well and that if you've still got some to come in the future that you're preparing well and just to wish you guys the very best of luck. Because obviously just from my perspective, you know, it's the engagement and the support that I get from you guys that are going through the med school interview process that helps keep this channel going and help make the platform what it is. I wouldn't be able to do what I do. Uh, without the support of you guys going through those very, very difficult and stressful interviews. So I did just want to say thank you so much again, as always. But today, this is one of those topics that a viewer on YouTube actually requested. And that is the idea of treatment priority and triage. This is this term that gets bandied around a lot, um, triage. You may have heard it before. And it can sometimes be quite difficult to understand exactly what it means and in what context it's used. So that's what today's video is going to be about. So as a very, very broad descriptor, triage describes the process by which we decide who is going to receive treatment first, or rather maybe the order in which we are going to treat people in a given context. And in this video, we'll talk a little bit about how those decisions are made, who actually makes those decisions and what the consequences of this process are for patients and for the NHS. And before we continue any further, I think it's really important to understand that I don't think you would ever be asked as part of a med school interview to make a triage decision for yourself because that requires medical knowledge and understanding of what all the various parameters that are used mean in context. Obviously, you're not expected to have those as a medical applicant, but I think just some understanding of not just how we make these decisions, but why these decisions get made is probably the more important thing for your interviews. And firstly, I think it can be useful to ask, why do we want to have triage at all? Why do we use it? Because we could have a system where the first person through the door is the first person who gets seen. And this seems fairly reasonable at first glance, because if we had this system, that means that when people arrive, say in the emergency department, that they're seen promptly, and because it's time dependent, it would encourage people who are ill or that have noticed that something is wrong to come and seek medical attention quickly because they know that they'll be seen quickly. Fairly quickly, however, the problems with an approach like that become apparent. And the first and most obvious one is that that time dependent situation makes no assessment of how severely unwell someone is or how urgent their clinical needs are. For example, if you have someone who is in the midst of a heart attack or is bleeding profusely from say a broken leg or they've got a severe head injury, they're likely to either die faster or to have more significant and serious long-term complications than someone who say comes in with a broken toe. The person with the broken toe in this situation, even though they may have attended first and walked in on their broken toe, they are able technically and medically speaking to be able to wait much longer without coming to significant harm than someone who is bleeding from a fractured leg. Essentially, if we're going to solve the medical problems of these people with the heart attack or the broken leg, they need to be seen more quickly, basically in order to avoid them dying. And it is for this reason that ultimately we need triage. And so now we can start to think about how we might triage people. How do we decide in practice who gets seen first and who doesn't? And there are very many of these systems in operation around the world. There is the START model, the revised trauma score, the injury severity score. And the thing is, is that the details before we all get carried away are not important. You don't need to learn the names of any of these or the ins and outs of them for your med school interview. The point is just be aware that they exist. And the really key issue is that we have these evidence-based systems that have been tried and found to work because that's a really important thing, because that's obviously a really important element of anything we do in medicine is that it actually works and benefits the patient. And we have these systems that aim to divide patients into one of several groups who is either already dead or beyond help, who do we need to see very quickly if we're going to prevent suffering or loss of life, and who can afford to wait before being seen. Even though we will see them, no patient will go unseen. We just need to work out some semblance of a priority system. In practice, this is mostly gonna be done by someone called a triage nurse, who when a patient comes into the ED, will carry out a preliminary assessment depending on the scoring system that's being used to work out whether they need emergency department care, whether they need to be taken further into the hospital and admitted as an inpatient and taken to a specialist unit, 
or they can be reassured and sent home. And what this also means is that ultimately a decision may need to be made about bed spaces. Does this patient require a bed? Because once the patient has been seen by either a doctor, an advanced nurse practitioner maybe, or a PA, essentially someone who can be medically responsible for them, are we going to give them a bed or not? And I'm using the term bed quite loosely here because as I'm sure you know, a hospital bed doesn't simply refer to the bed, the physical bed in which the patient sits and rests and gets better hopefully, it refers to the entire collection of resources that it takes in order to look after a patient that's in that bed. So it's the staff that are needed to monitor the patient in there, the food and drink that they receive while they're in hospital, the oxygen they might have, any medicines they might need, the regular reviews by medical staff, there's a lot of things we need to take into consideration. And I talked then about patients potentially being sent to different specialist units. Different specialties actually have their own triage guidelines on the care that particular patients receive. So the triage protocols for say neurosurgery will be very different to the triage guidelines for cardiology because different specialists are much more familiar with the types of specific care that different patients might need. And there are basically two reasons we want to do this. The first is keeping patient flow as efficient as possible. That is making sure that patients are sent to the correct area of the hospital as quickly as possible and not placed into areas that aren't the best for their care and to make most efficient use of our resources. Have patients in for as long as they need to be in, making sure that they make a full and proper recovery and then being sent home when they are medically fit for discharge so that we're making the best use of our resources. And ultimately, you know, we have a state funded limited resource system. We have to be considerate of how we use those resources. Does this system have problems? Yes, it's not great that people can have to wait three or four hours in the ED to be seen, for example. People can understandably be quite upset, particularly if they attend with a child maybe, who appears to them very acutely unwell, but they're not gonna be seen for a while. It can be very difficult for people to understand why this happens, but triage has to be quite mercenary in order for it to work. Because if we start to let cases slip through the system and let people be seen earlier or higher in the queue than they should be, or having them wait too long, then basically someone is gonna suffer at some level of the chain. And this is why, although it's difficult and it can be very emotionally challenging to have these conversations with people, you have to maintain proper triage otherwise people are gonna to come to harm. That's just how it is. And before we wrap up, another way of conceptualizing this might be the difference between emergency, urgent, and elective surgery. If somebody needs a joint replacement, for example, this is deemed as what's called elective surgery, meaning that it can take place at an elective time, which might be several months or six months in the future from the point when it's decided the surgery is needed. If someone's got an aggressively growing brain tumor that's likely to kill them, that's emergency surgery or very, very urgent surgery and it would be done within two weeks, for example. This is actually another example of triage, essentially where the emergency surgeries get done more quickly than the surgeries which still need to be done but won't kill the person if they're not done for a reasonable period of time. And just as a note to end on, you might consider private medicine, that is going and paying to have a hip replacement done privately off the NHS. This is essentially a way of skipping the triage system because these are contractual agreements between a surgeon, a practice and a patient, for example, and you don't need to prioritize your patients in the same way. It's very, you're paying me to do this operation, I will do this operation and no other people are involved. Whereas obviously in the NHS, that's simply not how it works. The NHS is responsible for all the operations that anyone might have. So you have to rank them relative to each other. Whereas in the private sector, that process doesn't need to happen. So that's where we're at guys. Thank you very much for watching. Please be sure to hit that like button for me, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel, and don't forget to go and check out ollieburton.com for my entire series of free interview preparation videos. And I will see you next time. Take care. Thanks for watching guys. There are three ways you can help out the channel. The first is by hitting that like button, subscribing to the channel and leaving me a comment. The second is you can buy me a coffee using my Ko-Fi link to help keep me awake during the editing process. And then number three is you can use my referral link to save 10% off your first year's subscription to Complete Anatomy 2021. The link is in the description below. Take care and I'll see you next time.